Today is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, and the epistle is taken from St. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Brethren, be thou renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man, who according to God is created in justice and holiness of truth. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak the truth to every man with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Let not the sun go down upon your anger. Give not place to the devil. And he that stole, let him now steal no longer. But let him rather labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have something to give to whoever suffers need. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. The Gospel reading is taken from the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus spoke to the chief priests and the Pharisees in parables. He said to them, The kingdom of heaven is like an unto a king who made a marriage feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call them that were invited to the marriage. But they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell them that were invited, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my beeves and fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come therefore to the marriage feast. But they neglected, and they went their own ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the rest laid hands on his servants, and having treated them badly, put them to death. Now when the king had heard of this, he was angry, and sending his armies, he destroyed those murderers and burnt their city. Then he said to his servants, The marriage indeed is ready, but they that were invited were not found worthy. Go therefore into the highways and byways, and as many as you shall find, call them to the marriage feast. And his servants, going forth into the ways, gathered together all that they found, both good and bad. And the marriage feast was filled with guests. And the king went in to see the guests, and there he saw a man who had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how camest thou hither, not having on a wedding garment? But the man was silent, and spoke not. Then the king said to the waiters, Bind his hands and feet, and cast him into the exterior darkness. There shall be there weeping and the gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but very few are chosen. This is the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have some announcements. The Mass tonight is offered for the repose of the soul of Bill Golpinist. The Knights of Columbus are sponsoring our Oktoberfest celebration on Saturday, November 11th, after the 4.30 Mass. Father Alvin Yu, Master of Ceremonies to the Archbishop, will be offering a solemn high requiem for our faithful departed on All Souls Day. November 2nd, and this will happen at 6 p.m. And Father Yu will be assisted by Father Ilo and Father Chung. Join the fun and support our school at the annual Stella Mortis Gala at Sound Saturday, November 4th. The parish will be sponsoring a concert of Russian folk and spiritual music this coming Saturday at 8 p.m. 
and our annual stewardship renewal weekends are coming up later this month when we plan our prayer, service, and financial giving for the year. Details on these events are found in the weekly bulletins, which are available at the doors of the church. Now this parable is a sustained allegory. That means that the characters and the events in the story stand for or represent something other than themselves. For example, the king in the story represents God the Father. The son of the king represents our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Messiah. And the wedding feast represents the messianic era, the time when the Messiah comes among us. Now remember that the time of the coming of the Messiah was very often represented in the Old Testament as a great wedding feast, especially in the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote, The Lord of hosts will at that time provide for all peoples a great feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy rich food and pure choice wines. Now we read in the Gospel that the king sent his servants to call to the feast those who were invited. Now those who were invited, they stand for and represent the chosen people, the Jews. And the first group of servants who were sent out were the early prophets of Israel. These early prophets preached strict obedience to the law of Moses. The law of Moses gave the people a certain cultural and more importantly a religious identity which distinguished and differentiated them from every other people so long as they remained faithful to the law. But collectively, not distributively, but collectively, the Israelites consistently lapsed into disobedience and infidelity. And of course, these unfaithful Jews are represented by the first group who refused to come to the feast. Now the second group of servants whom the king sent out to summon those invited represent the later prophets of Israel. Their message was more urgent, and they continuously warned the people to prepare for the coming day of the Lord. They warned them of the consequences of disobedience, and they also told them about the rewards of fidelity. And in response to these later prophets, sent by God, some Jews were indifferent and disinterested, but other Jews, in significant numbers, became enraged at the prophets because of their warnings and their threats, and they put the prophets to death. And so we read that the king, who represents God the Father, is furious at the hostile response of those whom he called to the feast. And so we read that he dispatched his army, he destroyed those murderers, and burned their city to the ground. Now that is a reference to the destruction of the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The destruction of, the, of Jerusalem, the dispersal of the Jews, this is seen as God's judgment upon the, collect, upon the Jews, taken collectively, for their infidelity and their refusal to accept the Messiah for whom they had been prepared across the centuries. And so we read in the parable then that the king sent out a third group of servants, but they have rather different instructions. Now this third group of servants represents the apostles. Remember, Jesus commissioned the apostles 
and he sent them out to preach to the Gentiles, to all the nations. And so the apostles and their successors went out, and they invited everyone whom they found to enter into the church, to accept baptism. And so the church then, the invitation to salvation passes from the Jews who were unfaithful to the Gentiles. And this mass of people whom the apostles and their successors invited into the church included both good and faithful people as well as wicked and unfaithful people. So the wedding hall, which represents the church assembled all together, was filled with members. Unfortunately, the membership was composed both of the wheat and the tars, the good and the wicked. Now that marks the end of the first part of the parable. The second part of the parable takes place in the great assembly hall. And all those, good and bad, who accepted the invitation of the apostles to join the church are assembled together awaiting the arrival of the king. And then as the parable continues, we read that when the king came into the wedding hall to observe the guests, he noticed there a man who was not wearing a wedding garment. Now the wedding garment, you must remember, it was a clean white tunic. It was handed out at the entrance to the hall, and it was handed out free of charge. It was handed out as a gift. The man, therefore, who didn't have on a wedding garment had refused to accept the gift of the wedding garment and had presumed to enter into the hall without the required apparel. This man stood against the king, refused to obey the king's law, and was therefore judged unfit for the kingdom. Now, of course, you know that the wedding garment symbolizes sanctifying grace, as the church teaches that in order to be saved, we must die in the state of sanctifying grace and with the supernatural virtue of faith in Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, the parable turns to judgment after death. And so we read, and the king said, how did, thou get, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man had nothing to say. He was mute. He was silent. And so the king said to his attendants, and they are representing the angels, bind him hand and feet, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. And that, of course, stands for the sentence of eternal damnation in hell. Now the point here is that one can only change one's ultimate goal so long as one remains in the body. Now what do I mean by one's ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is that which one wills or wants or seeks above everything else. It's the aim or purpose or goal in view of which, and for the purpose of attaining which, one directs one's whole energy, one's whole life, and one's works. Now, this ultimate goal can be changed. So long as we remain in the body, it can be changed, and it can be changed frequently, and it can be changed quickly, influenced as the will is by the passions of the body. And so St. Thomas writes, and this is from the Summa Contra Gentiles, Book 4, Chapter 92. No, Chapter 95. The soul, he writes, is in a mutable or changeable state so long as it is united to the body. But souls immediately after their separation from the body become unchangeable, immutable, fixed in will. And the result is that after
after death, the will in a separated soul cannot further be changed, neither from good to evil, nor from evil to good. So the question arises, why is it that death, which of course is the separation of the body from the soul, why is it that death makes it impossible to change one's will and to reorient oneself, as it were, to a different ultimate goal. St. Thomas points out that this ultimate goal can be either lawful or unlawful. And if we die in the state of pursuing an unlawful ultimate goal, which we place as the goal above all things, then after death or upon death, it is simply impossible for the will to make a decision reversing, or the will doesn't make a decision, I mean for the will to make a choice reversing that, that to choice. And so St. Thomas writes, the soul can change its will act by reason of some bodily passion. The will can be changed incidentally, along with sense changes in the body. But once the body is gone, as it is upon death, the will is fixed, frozen. Why is that? Because, as St. Thomas points out, and as the whole scholastic tradition affirms, there is nothing in the intellect that did not first come in through the senses. Now, so long as the soul is in the body, New knowledge can be generated in the intellect by reason of data entering through the sense powers. And the will, which depends upon the intellect,